First to get started, so I'm going to call to order our regular meeting of Tuesday, May 7, 2019. First item on our agenda is the opening prayer and pledges of allegiance to the flag of the United States and the state of Texas. If you'll join me in standing, Mr. Edwards will lead us this evening. Please bow your heads. Almighty Father, whose ways are higher than ours, whose path is greater than our own, and whose love never fails, let us always be aware of your presence and be obedient to your will. Keep us true to self and to our best judgment. Always guard us against dishonesty in our daily walk and on our life's journeys. Let us choose to stand against wrong as we pray for our enemies and as we count our blessings and as we complete our daily vows to you, our families, and to this community. Give us the strength today to forego doubt as we steadfastly strive to be faithful in the duties before us tonight. Guide us with constant reminders of why we serve this community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. All right, the next thing we have this evening, we have a couple of presentations. Uh, the first one uh, is about the student mayors and council members for the day. And so before we uh, get to... <laughs> Sometimes I get ahead of myself. Mrs. Dennis, would you like to introduce what we're doing here? Thank you. You'd think after seven years I'd know what I was doing. Well, Mayor and Council and uh, Citizens and uh, Management, wow, what a day we had with these students. As you know, we, we started this program several years ago to introduce municipal government to the seventh and eighth graders. Today was fabulous. I want to thank so many people because this is a huge and team effort, you know, that they helped me and assist with me to make this program possible. Today we had Dr. Brown. I thank you very much for interacting with the students. Uh, Mayor Pro Tim Hayward, Council Member uh, Cedric Edwards, and Tim Brown. Thank you so much for interacting with the students and telling them what you do. Um, there's so many people behind the scenes. Uh, today a presentation was done by our purchasing manager, um, I've got to say her name right, Julie, uh, and then Helen Lafeef. She is just so instrumental in going around with the kids and taking photographs. They tour the different facilities, but the main thing um, I'm thankful for is the uh, school district has recognized this as a very important program for the students, but I would turn it back over maybe to you, Mayor, because I think the students might have something to say. You know, we have a great group. We have Seth, Mackenzie, Kate, and Ella. So maybe you can see if they would like to say a few words. Most certainly I will. So first of all, uh, I had a chance to introduce myself and greet each of you earlier. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're pleased to have you uh, here at the city. Um, and and I, I know that each of you wants to share a, a little bit of commentary. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start from my right and work to my left. So um, first, and out here on the left, and you are, introduce yourself to everybody. Hi, I'm Cade Jackson. Cade Jackson, the whole gallery. Today was a great experience for me. Thank you so much for letting me have this opportunity. I definitely learned a lot. Um, the thing that I um, took home today was just how hard it is being a city council member most people don't realize that it takes hearing both sides of the story, discussing the story, and then voting on whether they want to approve it or not. And it's just really important to the entire community what you guys do, so thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you for joining us. <laughs> Next up, sir, if you'll introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, I'm Seth Gutierrez. I go to Corbett Junior High. Today, I learned many things through the church city government. I learned that the government is very nice. They provided me a good lunch and an opportunity to learn about my local government. I also got to learn about the EMS, firefighters, police, and political decisions we face today. Thank you, but more importantly, thank you to the mayor, the 
the pro tem, the council members, and the secretary of the city, and all of the people that have taught me and gave me this opportunity. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right, ma'am, if you'll introduce yourself to everyone. I am Ella Gomez. <clears throat> Today in my experience of exploring what happens as a city council, I learned that money is a big part in it. It limits, on, it limits on what the people need and on what the council can allow. I also realized how the city depends on other cities and citizens. For example, sometimes the police station needs help from other cities because there are not enough police. Thank you for the experience today and thank you for teaching me about city leadership. Very nice. And ma'am, if you'll introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Suarez, and I go to Corbett Junior High. Today, in my experience, I learned that letting, like, to make this city an amazing city, that some of the things that they go through to do this, and it's very hard to vote and decide because there's some money that could be going to EMS and firefighters and police officers, and we're using that money on some stuff that we don't really need. And it takes a lot to go through that. And thank you for letting me have this opportunity to do this. <laughs> Mayor, if I can have you and Dr. Brown come down. Thank you. Before we get started, I can't help but call it out. Some of you may have seen Mr. Larson stand up a bit when Miss McKenzie said, and sometimes we spend money on things we don't need. <laughs> I believe you have a fan, ma'am, <laughs> and a tutor if you want to run sometime. <laughs> you need to be, you've got to be 18 years old, have $25, that's all. Dennis. All right, Seth, come on up if you would, please, sir. All right, Cade, come on up, sir. So if you wish to stay for the entire meeting, you can. If you have homework and you need to go, we understand completely. Thank you all again for joining us tonight. Appreciate it.
All right, I'm going to go just a little bit out of order and jump down to a new employee recognition from Public Works. So we'll come on, come on up here and we'll, we'll do that first and then we'll move to our proclamations. <laughs> come on up. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Council, sir. Mr. Brown. Tonight I'd like to introduce you to three new employees uh, that started at uh, Public Works Department on April 1st of this year, and they all started out as servicemen ones in the Water and Wastewater Division. The first one here is Angel Alonzo. Angel was born and raised in Del Rio, Texas. He's a graduate of St. Phillips Community College. He's engaged and soon to be married, and his hobbies include automotive mechanics. All right, well, welcome, first of all. And by the way, speaking at the microphone is an option, not a requirement. But if you like, the option's yours. Sir? Thank you. Uh, I just want to say I'm grateful uh, for working for the City of Shirts. Well, we're very pleased to have you and hope you'll be with us for a long time. Welcome. Very good. All right. The next employee I want to introduce you is Devin. Tell me if I get it right. Salako. Salako. Um, Devin was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. He's been in Texas for the last five years. He has a three-year-old daughter, and his hobbies include hiking, camping, fishing, and he, then he just told me he was hunting, too, so. All right. Well, welcome. <laughs> you go, Pat. I told you it's an option. It's not a requirement at all. <laughs> the next employee is Jordan Villarreal. Jordan was born in Austin, Texas, raised in Shirts and Converse area. He's graduated from Samuel Clemens High School in 2009. Go both. <laughs> He's married and has two sons and a dog, and his hobby is his kids. All right. Very good. Again, to all three of you, welcome. We're happy to have you on the team. All right, next up we have a few proclamations to read. I'm going to go ahead and come down to the um, podium there and, uh, and read these three. Be right there. One more thing before I come down and read the proclamations. We do have with us this evening Michael Moore from Troop 398 working on a merit badge. Which merit badge are you working on? Citizenship in the community? Fantastic. Welcome. We're very happy to have you with us tonight. take these in the order in which they're stacked and if I deviate from the agenda my apologies first one first one that I have this evening is a proclamation on our economic development week May 6 through 11 2019 and the proclamation reads like this whereas economic developers promote economic well-being and the quality of life for their communities by creating and retaining jobs that facilitate growth support workforce development, enhance wealth, and provide a stable tax base. And whereas the City of Shirts has a rich history of mayors, city councils, boards, and commissions, city staff, chambers of commerce, public-private partners, and residents who work together to promote economic development and, let me make this easier, whereas in 1998 with voter approval, the City of Shirts Economic Development Corporation, or SEDC, was established to lead the city's efforts to grow our economy in accordance with the provisions of the Development Corporation Act of 1979. And whereas in the spirit of teamwork, the SEDC and the City of Shirts work in unity to grow our local economy through the attraction and retention of primary jobs, providing infrastructure to attract new business and supporting career training. And whereas over the past 20 years, the City of Shirts and the SEDC have partnered to bring about multiple projects that have benefit Benefited Shirts residents by leveraging incentive tools such as the construction of infrastructure, tax abatements, reimbursements, grants, and loans. And whereas the economic development efforts by this community have helped both small and large companies make significant capital investments within our city and create jobs for our residents. Now, therefore, I, Michael Carpenter, as the mayor of the city of Shirts, hereby proclaim the week of May 6 to 11, 2019 as Economic Development Week and reaffirm this city's support and commitment to seeking out opportunities to further our economic development by investing into our local economy. All right, we have our whole team here. Want to try that microphone? Sure. Please do. 
Mayor, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to recognize Economic Development Week. Uh, economic development is very alive and, and strong and, and in full force here in the city of Shirts. A couple of things that, we, that were said that we want to highlight, make sure that everybody knows here and also those who are watching uh, online. Uh, first and foremost is that economic development is a team sport, uh, and that's very much alive here in the city of Shirts. Uh, first and foremost with you know, our, our boards, councils, commission, um, city employees, our partners with the chamber. Um, it, it truly takes a, a team effort of bringing everybody together in order to make the, the deals happen that create new investment within our community and help create new jobs that ultimately you know, allow our, our community to have the money that we need to be able to, to do the things that we want and have the quality of life that we have. So here with me I have a couple of our economic development staff that we wanted to highlight as well. Uh, we have Jennifer Colby. Uh, she is our business retention manager and something very important to us here in the city of Shirts as we focus on our existing companies, um, helping them to ensure that they can grow and that they have the same tools and resources as those companies that we try to attract. Uh, we want to help grow our own and, and we have made significant strides and efforts over the last couple of years as we, as we have had Jennifer here on our team. Uh, we also have Patty Haran. Patty Haran does a lot of the work behind the scenes uh, in running our economic development organization. Uh, the economic development board is made up of seven members. We meet each month and Patty's the one who pulls all of those together uh, so that we can have those meetings uh, and you know, ultimately evaluate those projects that impact our community. Um, our meetings are available and open to everybody. We encourage everybody to participate. The more community participation that we have in economic development, we believe that we will have a stronger community. So on behalf of the Economic Development Corporation, the staff, and all of the partners that make up the uh, economic development efforts in the city of Shirts, thank you very much. We, we do have our Shirts investment pins that we have that we'll pass out. Um, for information on the pins and economic development, I encourage everybody to visit the economic development website. That is shirtsedc.com. Uh, we have a blog to help the community really understand the, the basic building blocks of economic development. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Let's come around up front here. Mayor, I'd like to just uh, recognize our great economic development team with uh, Kyle and Jennifer and Patty and Drew. Um, the words dedicated and innovative come to mind when I think of the work that they're doing. Uh, I think it's making a tremendous impact and uh, they do a great job for us every day, so I appreciate it. All right, next up, I have a proclamation regarding the 50th anniversary of M Municipal Clerks Week. By the way, one of the values of having exceptional staff in the city secretary's position, our municipal clerk staff, is they, they have um, uh, shorter proclamations with big letters. <laughs> Makes it easier to read. So I won't need the readers for this one. Whereas the office of the municipal clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government, exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk is the oldest among pub public servants, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk provides the professional link between the citizens, the local governing bodies, and agencies of the government at other levels, and whereas municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all, and whereas the municipal clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community, and whereas municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of the municipal clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, provincial, county, and international professional organizations, and whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the office of the municipal clerk in this city and all cities, 
In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand the seventh day of May and caused the seal of the city of church to be affixed as we recognize Municipal Clerks Week, May 5 through 11, 2019. Please. Indeed. Oh, my goodness. Good call. Here. And here. Thank you. Would you like to say something about what it is that you do? I just want to let everyone know that, you know, um, 11 years ago, I moved here, and I believe that now I have found my true family. Um, this is the job that we do cannot be done unless I have the cooperation of the citizens and the, the tremendous staff that this city has. We work so well together. You, you kind of stole my thunder. We're a team. Uh, we're a team. Uh, I do a lot. I mean, I prepare your agendas, I uh, answer um, some silly questions from citizens. I, I try to. Sometimes, uh, and sometimes some questions from the mayor and the council. Um, I, run the, uh, I run the elections, which, you know, one of the things, you know, our office has to be very, um, we are not bipartisan, you know, we were, you know, hey, we, we treat everybody equally. But I think the main thing is, you know, I started this career, wow, hmm, 17, 18 years ago. I didn't start out to be a city secretary, but uh, this is the best profession for me, and I've been here 11 years, and I hope and pray that I'll be able to retire here, but I do want to recognize somebody that I have that is my right-hand young lady. You know, Gail's only been with us since December, but I feel like she's been with me forever. I want to thank the council. I want to thank the citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Gail. You, I couldn't do it without you. Mayor, again, I just want to recognize the work that Brenda does. Uh, you know, she orchestrates our meetings, and, uh, you know, she's largely responsible for getting everything done for the city. So we appreciate you, Brenda. And Gail, it's great to have you as a new member of our team. So we certainly appreciate that. I don't, I don't think we have all the videos of the meetings from years and years and years ago posted, correct? We don't have the videos, but I believe that we have a lot of the um, DVDs. And I remember Mayor, when, oh, should I say this? I'm going to go ahead and say it. When I met the mayor, he, had, he didn't have any gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't need reading glasses. <laughs> All right, our, our next proclamation is Community Action Month, May of 2019. And it says, whereas the Community Council of South Central Texas Incorporated was established as a community action agency on May 11, 1965. That was actually before I was born. Whereas the service area encompasses the South Central and Southwest Texas counties of Atascosa, Bandera, B, Comal, Dimmit, Edwards, Frio, Gillespie, Guadalupe, Carnes, Kendall, Kinney, Kerr, LaSalle, Live Oak, Maverick, McMullen, Medina, Real, Uvalde, Valverde, Wilson, and Zavala. And whereas community action emerged from the heart of President Lyndon B. Johnson's 1964 proclamation of America's War on Poverty, where battles must be won in the field in every private home and every public office from the courthouse to the White House. And whereas community action has made essential contributions to individuals and families across this nation by creating economic opportunities and strengthening communities. And whereas community action is a robust state and local force connecting people to life-changing services and creating pathways to prosperity in 99% of all American counties. And whereas community action builds and promotes economic stability as an essential aspect of enabling and enhancing stronger communities and stable homes. And whereas community action promotes community-wide solutions to challenges throughout our cities, suburbs, and rural areas, and whereas community action delivers innovative services and supports support that create greater opportunities for families and children to succeed, and whereas community action insists 
on community participation and involvement, ensuring that all sectors of the community have a voice and will be heard. And whereas Community Action is celebrating 55 years of innovation, impact, and providing proven results for Americans, and witness whereof I'm here, set, here and to set my hand the seventh day of May 2019, commemorating Community Action Month. All right. I'm here for this one. I'm, my name is Deborah Martinez, and I'm a representative with Community Council of South Central Texas. And I just want us to say also that it is a team, a team effort to help um, our vulnerable populations in our counties to become self-sufficient. So everything's about teamwork. Uh, our vision is helping people, changing lives. And by, I want to thank the mayor and the council and the city of Shirts because by this confirmation, um, I'm sorry, the proclamation that we're signing here today, you're also helping people changing lives. So thank you. All right, we've already taken care of the new employee recognition, so we're going to go to city events and announcements. And first up, we have announcements of upcoming city events. Who has the duty this evening? Mr. James. I'll take it. So just as a reminder, uh, and Maggie may speak to this, there are a couple of ribbon cuttings coming up, uh, an open house and ribbon cutting, uh, South Texas Radiology Imaging Centers, 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, May 8th. Uh, that's 5,000 Shirts Parkway, Suite 500. Um, South Texas Radiology Imaging Centers will have its open house and ribbon cutting for their new MRI unit. There will be hors d'oeuvres, drinks, and door prizes, as well as music. Uh, Thursday, May 9th, Northeast Partnership meets at 1130. That's at Olympia Hills Golf and Conference Center. Saturday, May 11th, Parks is doing another nature discovery series, What's Swimming, at 10 a.m. at Crescent Bend Park. Thursday, May 14th, is the Shirts Police Memorial Service. That's at 10 a.m. It'll be in the Civic Center, and lunch will follow. And then finally, uh, that evening, we'll have the City Council meeting at 6 p.m. here in Council Chambers. Very good. Thank you, sir. Next up, announcements and recognitions by the City Manager. Dr. Brown? Yes, uh, Mayor. Thank you. I have one uh, this evening, and it's actually very good news, and that is that the animal care facility is now open again. It opened today. And so I uh, just wanted to appreciate the great work that our team has done uh, through the flooring project. And I think uh, great days are ahead for our animal care team, but particularly our IT folks, our facility services folks, our animal care services, and also the police department did a great job. Uh, I'd like to recognize just a few of them by name, and that's first of all Brian James, who led the team, Assistant Police Chief Bain, uh, Todd Buckingham in facilities, and our animal care manager, Ginger Despain. So I uh, just appreciate all their hard work, their great effort. Uh, there were some obstacles, but um, we overcame as the team did, and we're really happy to have the facility back open. Very good, thank you, sir. Next item, announcements, recognitions by the mayor. I have nothing this week, so we'll move on to hearing of residents and signing up this evening is Maggie Titterington. Maggie? Good evening, council. Uh, as uh, Mr. James said, yes, we do have the open house tomorrow. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art MRI. It's something totally different uh, that they're very excited and not sharing a whole bunch of information about, so I guess it's one of those you have to see it to believe it. Uh, it's actually going to go until 7 o'clock tomorrow night, so if you can't make it between the 4.30 and 5.30, which is when we're going to cut the ribbon, please make it out there for the food, the prizes, and the music. Next week, we have a very busy week. Uh, at 9.30, we have a plaque presentation on the 16th at the chamber for our member, Mosaic Capital Solutions. We have a mixer that night at HEB 3009 Restaurant from 5.30 to 7. And then on the 17th, which is the next day, uh, welcoming another shirts business. Uh, it's a ribbon cutting for Brazilian Top Team. And that's at 1420 Shirts Parkway, right down the sidewalk from the chamber house at 1 p.m. Um, and other than that, I just wanted to add my thanks to Mr. James, 
to Councilwoman Hayward and uh, Councilman Gutierrez for uh, joining myself and uh, Mark Roberts and also Lisa Wood and some other people from uh, the planning and development for just trying to continue to work with Mr. Roberts with uh, his plans and everything. It was a great meeting. Uh, Mr. James and his team just had a lot of information and so we just really appreciated them taking the time and meeting and discussing so that I could also have a better understanding and grasp. And I'm very excited to see the workshop coming up, so I'm not quite sure what Mr. James is gonna talk about, but very much looking forward to that. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, next up, I tell you how, uh, All right, I understand that our workshop's going to be uh, in some detail. Uh, so what I'd like to do is see if we can dispose of the consent agenda items and our one discussion item. Well, actually, we have multiple discussion. We'll just uh, see if we can dispose of the consent agenda items first. So the first item that we have listed, minutes, consideration or action regarding the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of April 23rd, 2019. Item number two, resolution 19R57. A resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the city manager into an, an agreement for custodial cleaning service contracts with Vanguard Cleaning Systems and UBM Enterprise Incorporated and other matters in connection therewith. Item three, resolution 19R58, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, appointing Dudley Waite to the Board of Directors, place D2 of the Shirts Seguin Local Government Corporation and other matters in connection therewith. Item number four, resolution 19R62, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorize, approving a policy relating to the financial audit and other matters in connection therewith. Any of these items need to be pulled for individual consideration. Mayor, like uh, number four to be pulled, please. Item number four, any others? I'm sorry. I'm sorry? <clears throat> That's number... Number four? Yes, number four. Okay, yes. very good. Uh, if there are no others, then is there a motion to approve items number one, two, and three on consent? So moved. That was a dead heat, so I'm gonna say... Uh, I'll second. Uh, <laughs> motion from Mr. Edwards, a second from Mr. Gucci. <clears throat> Any other uh, comments, questions for council? Hearing none, I'm going to call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes and no nays. Motion carries. Item number four is resolution 19R62, resolution by the City Council, City of Shirts, Texas, approving a policy relating to the financial audit and other matters in connection therewith. Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, but the only thing I had was uh, uh, item number three on this. It, it says no auditing firm will be allowed to conduct a city audit for more than 10 consecutive years. And, and the question I had is, um, where did that figure of 10 years come up? Uh, the normal auditing contract when we award for a new auditor is a three-year term with two one-year extensions. So basically, uh, this is a, the same firm could win two consecutive contracts back-to-back uh, -back before we would be forced to switch. Uh, there's nothing else behind that. The committee just thought that that was an appropriate number of times to award a contract to a, uh, a single firm. Okay, sounds reasonable. Uh, Mayor, given that, I make a motion that we approve resolution 19R62. Second. I have a motion from Dr. Scagliola, a second from Mr. Edwards. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays, the motion carries. We're gonna go now to the workshop with, go that, with regard to the Unified Development Code or UDC update. Mr. James, Mrs. Wood. Oh, we have the whole crowd. We're going to tag team on this one. All right, very good. Uh, we'll see how long my voice lasts. Um, All the mold in the air, you sound a bit like I, how, how I feel. Okay, so we wanted to, to do an update on the Unified Development Code. And just to remind folks in the audience and on council, uh, on March 26, just over a month ago, um, at the request of council, staff did a number of work session items on a number of kind of policy items and projects that would be would come out of the planning department. One are we, as you know, we have a number of properties that we have under annexation agreements. Those annexations agreements are coming to the end of their term, and so staff needs to start the process of initiating those annexations. Uh, the other was to look at a comprehensive land use plan update. We heard from another number of residents down in Southern Shirts 
um, who felt like the plan that we had created in the past didn't necessarily fit today. Uh, Bryce Cox has also done a couple of presentations about some areas where development's not consistent with plan or zoning, it's not consistent. And then lastly, there was an item with regard to the UDC update. Generally, council's direction, yeah, we want to move forward with all of those uh, going forward. Um, but, but just as it impacts sort of the workload, as a reminder, uh, staff is currently working with the Planning and Zoning Commission on the issue of short-term rentals and pit pads. Um, at the direction of council, it was to let's get PNZ to take a look at it working with staff. Staff's been doing that with them going forward. And that's relevant because, um, you know, and why we're here tonight is we had a council member ask for an update on it on April 25th. This was the meeting we could get on. But as a reminder, the Planning and Zoning Commission has to make recommendations on updates to the Unified Development Code. And we've generally used the Planning and Zoning Commission as sort of that public sounding board. We may bring in other groups. We may hold a number of different public hearings. We may do stakeholder groups, but they're an integral part of that UDC update. And so again, part of what we're working with them on now is the short-term rental pit pad discussion um, to try to get direction. And I, I, I'd be sort of blunt, it it's, can be a challenge, more than a challenge, to try to move a number of these efforts forward at the same time. Uh, sometimes it's really helpful for us to be able to finish one up, knock it off, and then move on to the next one. Doesn't mean we can't do multiple, but there's some challenges with that. And so again, what we're hoping to do is kind of kind of move that one along. But with regard to the UDC, I think, you know, we, we've heard from, again, Mark Roberts has stood up a number of times. We've heard some other people, council members have asked questions. And while we get comments about various parts of the Unified Development Code, which includes our drainage ordinance and includes our construction standards for streets and utilities. The big one that people tend to talk about are those site design standards generally, and maybe a little bit more beyond that. But it really is uh, somebody walking in saying, I want to build an office building, I want to build a restaurant, I want to build something like that. And so, so the idea is rather than tackle the whole thing, and you may recall that we've done, I think, the first three chapters have been updated. A couple years ago, staff started trying to tackle this. We did the first three chapters of it, and that included some important parts, vesting and things like that, laid out a number of things, but then we just frankly got bogged down with the work, and, and so we're here. And so when we tackle this, our recommendation is let's start with those site design standards, those are this thing that affects commercial projects, whether they fit within that section, and we think we can kind of knock out what the community is most interested in. And then again, we'll be able to work through the entire unified development code, which needs to happen, but, but that tends to come to the forefront less often. Um, just as a reminder, when we came in March, these were some of the areas that we were hearing from folks about. It's the exterior construction, the art standards, landscaping, screening, building the masonry wall, tree preservation, uh, some of the additional design requirements. And again, that, you know, I mentioned one council person, that's where our ordinance can be confusing. Folks normally want to go to the landscaping section, but you have to know to look in that transportation section for a particular provision. So if your landscape architect is clicking through the landscaping section, he'll design a plan, turns it in, and the staff goes, oh yeah, but the section down here, that's got a requirement that affects it as well, and you miss that one. And so again, part of this that we would do is clean up to put stuff in, in one spot, make it easier to use. Um, but again, outdoor display and storage has been an issue, and then we've had some stuff with non-conforming uses, a question about sheds and things like that in the past. You guys chime in as you need to. We'll see how this goes. Okay, but a, a couple of the challenges that we've got, again, as I mentioned, we'd really like to try to knock out the pit pads first. It's just tough for us to run both of those. We are going to PNZ tomorrow night. We've talked to them in the past. Again, not to speak for PNZ, they may have a different take on it, but I came away from that first meeting with the feeling, not sure we really have a problem here with regard to short-term rentals and pit pads. Um, you know, we don't have a whole lot of them relative to other communities. How many did like Fredericksburg and New Braunfels have on the short-term? Uh, about 600 in New Braunfels and about 700 in Fredericksburg. How many do you think we have looking on the site? 18 to 22. So order of magnitude, we have far fewer 
the New Braunfels and Fredericksburg. So not to speak for PNZ, but I think that was a bit of the issue. The other is, is and council talked about this, some of the impacts from those, they aren't really that different from a family that may be living next to you with a bunch of kids and multiple cars and things like that. But we'll see where it goes, but our hope is that we're not gonna take another three months on this, that we're gonna be another month or so and, and come back to council and then we can kind of put that one to bed and move on with the next one, but it's a, it's a factor. Um, and then the other thing, just to remind council, is staff is working very hard on the implementation of City View. <coughs> and City View is the software program that you authorized and EDC helped with of about a half million dollars. And that's that development software to really streamline and update that process to digitize it. And I will say to speak for staff, when they went out and looked at other communities, when they read through some reports that had been done by companies evaluating development processes in different communities, they really felt like where communities fell short on that is they didn't do the implementation the way they needed to. They'd stick one person in charge and kind of say, yeah, we need you to work on this while you do your other stuff. And, and they frankly didn't have time to do it. You've got this very expensive, sophisticated software program. You're not getting the most out of it. It's a bit, not to, not, my mother doesn't see this, but it's my mother with her iPhone. It's too complicated for her. She needs two or three different functions, and, and so she loses a lot of things and often gets confused about how to do things with it. Is always afraid to check an email while talking to me that she'll hang up on me. And so, so there is a bit of that, but, but they have seen it. The other is you have one person, that person leaves the city, and nobody has that institutional knowledge. So you may recall that it got to the point to, to keep it on track, they pulled Bryce Cox out of that day-to-day -day activity, moved him physically up to the city manager's part so that he could keep working on that. And so again, we're not working at full capacity because that project is in process. And so again, doesn't mean we can't do some other stuff, but just realize we've got this very important project that we rate as, as a high priority, because frankly, we've got a lot invested into it and the community's anticipating a lot, and we think it can do it. And I will say staff has done a lot of that. Even Mark Roberts, you remember he showed a site plan with comments. Those comments were done digitally. And so that's where staff has said, hey, part of the problem is when it's, you turn it on day one and you've got this whole new system. So they've been implementing parts of it so that staff is used to working in that environment. So comments done on Bluebeam, inspections are uh, done through online web QA now, and so we're kind of working that into it to have a smoother transition. So again, don't want to say we can't do anything else, but, but to be real clear, we have this big project that's eaten up a bunch of time that, that I think folks don't see that's a challenge for us. Um, but moving on from that, I think, you know, as we talked about what are kind of these criticisms, if we had to kind of compartmentalize and characterize them, it's our standards, the big one is our standards, basically they limit how much you can put on a piece of property. And that's really what it kind of comes down to. Somebody has a vision of what they want to build. I want to build a 5,000 square foot office building and I need this many parking spaces for it. And they pick a piece of property and they settle on that. And then as they get into designing it, it becomes a challenge to make it all fit. Now, it may be the shape of the property, it may be how much landscaping is required, it may be a functionality issue with their site. I've got to have a drive through and the drive through has to have this much stacking, not an office, but a, a, say a Starbucks, for example. And so they have operational constraints that affect them. But what it really comes down to is, can they fit what they want on that piece of property? And we've talked about this before. Some of the challenges you're gonna see on uh, Schertz Parkway and for instance, at, at Woodland Oaks across from Pascal, that site with a challenge because that lot size was created a number of years ago with the residential neighborhoods. And as our standards have changed, as we've gotten more and more traffic on Shirts Parkway, it's, it's an issue now where it may not have been in the past. And so that's become a bit of a factor, but ultimately it comes down to that site would have been easier to do if they had shrunk that building by say 25%. Now we can, as staff stand here and say, yeah, just shrink it by 25%, but it may not function for them. It may not be cost effective. It may not turn, but that's part of where this rub really comes in. The big one is, can they fit what they want on the site? And often the nature of the discussion is these city standards are the problem as opposed to, I just have a piece of property that's not big enough. 
And that even can be when they create that property themselves. They may come in and create a piece of property today, turn around, come in on it, and it creates a challenge. But that fundamentally is the issue because that's where a lot of the costs come in. What's it cost for the property? Typically more land, you're paying more. If it has infrastructure to it, typically you're paying more. You're paying less if it doesn't have water, sewer, if you have to extend it. But the developer isn't necessarily looking and saying, this particular line item is the problem. It's the overall cost. So when they tack on impact fees, building permit fees, design costs, construction costs, landscaping purchase, property call, all of that adds up and they go, oh, my budget's tight. You look to cut, and at that point, they tend to start looking at code requirements going, as far along as I am, can I cut masonry off the building because I can reduce the cost? Or can I cut landscaping? I can reduce the cost. So I think that's just the nature of it works, but it's partly how you approach it as opposed to if everybody fully understood that and said, this is what I have to do, and then found the property that fit it, we wouldn't have necessarily some of those challenges. But it's the way it works, and we need to, we need to kind of acknowledge and accept that because if we kind of tilt against windmills, we're going to constantly have problems as opposed to that's sort of the thing we have to work through. But I think that's a lot of where the problem comes in. But the other is it's, it's expensive. And as I talk too, when you start adding those costs up, for every tree you have to buy, for every tree you have to mitigate, for every curb cut you have to build, for every shielded light fixture you have to put in, for every bit of stone you have to put in as opposed to stucco, your, your costs rise. And again, it can be a challenge on certain projects. The next is it takes too long. Uh, it, takes, it takes too long to get through the process. Again, I'll talk about that more in a minute, and, and sometimes staff would say, yeah, it, God, I'm surprising it does take a long time to get through. It really shouldn't take that long. Others, it's the nature of the project. If you don't have zoning, you've got to go through the zoning process first. Then you've got to go through the platting. To get your plat filed, you've got to construct the water line or sewer line to it. Then you kind of typically do your site plan. Once your site plan's approved, then you can turn in your building plans and those go through. And, and staff will flex with some of that stuff to the degree they can, but it creates some challenges in and of itself. If they start reviewing building plans before the site plan's approved and a change has to occur, that means the building plans have to change and people have spent money on it, staff has spent time reviewing it, and, and so you get some of that. So it's a, it's a balancing act. And then the other, frankly, is it's a bit of this staff is just difficult to work with. You know, and it, it could be that it's they're slow to respond, there's no flexibility, they're not pleasant, they don't seem to like me, it's it's whatever that sort of goes into that. And you, you guys have heard that, we hear that too. It's it kind of works the same way. Staff probably has similar feelings with developers as well, but but we've got to work together and we need to make the best of it. But I think that's part of a challenge. So we hear the process is so tough, it's often one or a combination of those that, that create that issue. Okay, so talking about each one of those, so again, that issue is site standards that limit development of a site. And so again, as I mentioned, are we expecting developers to size their project based on the lot size and our standard? Meaning, I know how big the property is, I know what the development standards, and I've gotta size my building to fit that, or, is it really the developer needs, here's their pro forma, I gotta put that 5,000 square foot building, and this is the piece of property I picked, so our standards need to change and adjust to allow that. And, and that's sometimes how it's approached because the person will buy that piece of property and so they're in on it. And so one thing you hear staff talk about a lot is, if I were you, I would not buy the property until you knew you can do what you wanna do on it. Because if you get stuck, you're, you're stuck. But examples of where our standards take up more land. So we require parking spaces of 10 feet by 20 feet. It's 200 square feet. Other communities, it's nine by 18. It's 162 square feet. Now you may say, well that doesn't seem like a lot. But when you're building 100 parking spaces and you have to have the backing area and you have to have landscape areas per the number of parking spaces, that stuff really starts to add up. It can make a big difference because we want bigger parking spaces. Again, you can probably all sit here and some of your, your minds are going, going, yeah, but we all drive these big trucks. We've got folks who may struggle to get in. My 15-year-old who's got his learner's permit, you're happy when he's pulling into a 10 by 20, not a nine by 18. <laughs> so the reasons we do it, and our citizens tend to tell us they like that. 
I like the fact that our parking spaces are, are bigger. It's easier to get in and out of. You don't get your car dinged up as much. So there's good and bad to it. But that's one that, again, you can clearly point to go. It eats up more land. It makes it tough. You know, the other is landscaping. We've got about a dozen provisions of you have to have landscaping here and here and here and here. And you can click through most of those and find those. Again, there's that one that's oddly located that's pretty easy to crack. Let's move it over to this section. Well, where that can be a challenge is, so for instance, we require typically a 20-foot landscape buffer at the front of the property. And we require you to plant trees. I hope y'all are nodding and not going, he yeah. doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> You're required to plant trees in that landscape buffer. And so normally that can work. The problem is, and Jimmy Hooks left, if Jimmy Hooks is back there and going, wait a minute, I got a sewer easement. Trees and sewer lines do not mix. So yeah, while the code allows you to overlap an easement with a landscape buffer, the code also says you can't plant a tree within a certain distance of a line or necessarily within that easement. And that's one of the things that's, that you've got in different sections, there's no way to deal with it. But somebody who, who maybe, you know, and that's fairly typical every place, I gotta be honest with you. But the problem can be is if they miss that or as this stuff comes in incrementally, it can be a problem. So for instance, on 1103, on 1518, TxDOT's doing projects. TxDOT shut them and says, hey, we need a little bit of money and we're gonna spend a bunch of money fixing these roads. And we go, yay. But what they also then say is, but I need you to move your utilities out of my way. And so Jimmy, again, you've seen him come forward asking to acquire an easement, asking for contracts to move that stuff. And so if you're in process, that can be a challenge because we got these things working parallel and what was the answer yesterday may not be the answer tomorrow but I don't want to have this problem forever of trees and sewer. And so, so you can get some things like that, that the specifics of a site create a challenge for you. Not everybody, but at times they can. You know, the other is um, number of parking spaces. So for instance, on office, we require one parking space for every 200 square feet of office area. Your Braunfels, one for 300. So now you're kind of in your head going, all right, I got a big office building. We require more parking spaces and they're bigger. All, all that stuff sort of adds up. Again, there's not a right or wrong. There are just implications to it, but folks here tend to say, I like bigger parking spaces and I want to make sure we don't have some of those problems in other places where there's not enough parking. And we certainly have seen that. Um, what's the place off 3009 with the, the medical office building there? Um, of a 3009, we're on the side Telemedical. street. Telemedical. Telemedical, we, you've heard this before. There's a parking problem. Part of it is that it's it, the standard that works for 80% of the people. You've got to go in business, doesn't work for it. So again, I'll, I'll pick a business that's no longer here. Sorry for those folks who love Jack in the Box. But it was, you never had a problem finding a parking space at Jack in the Box, right? But... Good luck at Chick-fil-A that half day of school or that first day of summer, I wouldn't go near that place because you're not finding a parking spot. It's, it's the nature of the business. And so part of what we do is you, you don't park everything for the, week, the weekend before Christmas. It's a waste of space, but it's a balancing act. But, but that's where this stuff kind of adds up. There's not a right or a wrong answer. There are implications to it, but it eats up land. Does that make sense? Losing my voice, so I'm gonna hand off here in a minute. The other is cost, and simply some of our requirements have a bigger cost to it. So where we want masonry, that's typically more expensive than EFIS. EFIS is fairly cheap to put up. So when we say, uh, I want stucco, or I want brick, or stone, or synthetic, that there's a dollar cost assigned to that. And so when they're looking to cut costs, that's an area. But you, know, you can take it further, we don't allow metal buildings, all metal buildings, we allow some metal. But other communities allow metal buildings. We've said that's not who we want to be. As an example, our parking spaces and those vehicular use areas, you've got to pave them with asphalt or concrete. All, all communities don't do that, and we get, we get this from time to time. Well, I can do flex space, you know, or I can do um, gravel, chip seal. chip seal. You know, you get more dust for it, you get some issues. We, we've just set the bar here, and, and so, it's not a right or wrong, but they're clearly on some of these, it, with the vehicular use, you're taking up the same amount of area, there's just a higher cost to doing asphalt or concrete than chip sale. It's 
solely a dollar figure. Um, it's the screening one, so where we require that masonry wall. That makes sense, but, but I think, you know, other, other cases you look at and go, oh, yeah, I'm glad we have that. Those residents would not be happy. Others you look at and go, it's a really big lot, and it's a residential zoning district, not a use, and that use isn't probably going to be there forever. So you can maybe make some adjustments to it, but, but you probably wouldn't want to do away with it altogether. You want to talk on this one? Okay, I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to turn on these. So, um, so th when it comes to taking too long, there are times when projects do take a long time, and sometimes it is on us uh, as staff, but then there are some times as we work through things, um, we have to go to the Planning and Zoning Commission through our Planning and Zoning a department when we start from the beginning at zoning and it takes multiple processes and hearings through our planning and zoning commission city council and and staff review for us to get through that um, sometimes it has to do with uh, workload and the the amount of projects that we have the size of the projects when we had two of those large school projects we spent a lot of time doing plan review and so some of the smaller projects the the time got exp extended in time frames um, uh, but then also, as we talked before, as Brian had mentioned, there are times when um, we are, in trying to be flexible, we allow people to bring in plans um, before they're actually all the way through the process. And what that sometimes does is it has us start this review, and the expectation is for us to get it out in a certain period of time, but then plans change in between time. And so what we end up doing is having to re-review. They get a second set of comments and they think that we're at times providing them additional things to do when sometimes it's just kind of that lack of knowing from the beginning of the process. Um, we actually have started working on, um, with, with the implement, impt, uh, implementation of the new software, and um, we've started working on actually even a different type of review and input um, to manage our paper process even better by using SharePoint and a planner and, and assigning out tasks and things that our software currently doesn't do. Um, so, anything further you wanted to add to that? Well, just, just the one thing. So some of those are kind of on staff. It's our workload, how busy, what our process is. But some of them are frankly on the developer. And I got a call from a guy last week going, I, I need to figure out where my permit is. We are frustrated, we are not, it's taking too long. We got this deadline. We get it. So I go down and ask engineering and building inspections. They're like, "Yeah, we just got it in two days ago." So I call the guy back and go, "Yeah, we just got it in two days ago." And he's like, well, "I thought you got it a month ago." I'm like, "No, we just got it two days ago." See if we can move it out. So sometimes it's again how long it takes to get the revisions in. The other, and staff will kind of tell you this because they'll, they'll sort of groan, is how clean it is coming in, and 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 sometimes we'll get something where the applicant has done a number of these, they're familiar with how codes work, they'll call us up and go, hey, we're looking at doing this on this piece of property, I have five questions about your standards, very specific. You come in very tight, very clean, you've moved through. The other is, it's not what they normally do. The example I've given is my dad was a dentist. He built a new office, not what he did. But he struggled to sort of manage that despite having people to do it. It's just not what he was familiar with. And, and, and so, also, if you hire folks or you're trying to do it maybe with somebody who typically doesn't work in shirts, they're not as familiar with the code. And sometimes, frankly, they'll go, look, I'm kind of familiar with San Antonio. We'll just turn in what meets San Antonio, and we'll have them tell us what's wrong, and then we'll fix it. Because it's probably not that different, but that's a more efficient way to do it than have somebody spend a day going through our code. I mean, we, we get that at times. And so that can slow the process down. And then the last one really is, um, or a couple things. One is, the more requirements we have, the more there is for staff to check. So I talked about those dozen or so landscape requirements. If we wanted to go 15 or we wanted to drop to eight or nine, that's less work for staff to do. And, and you know, Emily and Nick are kind of handling all those developments. How many cases do you guys each have right now? Kind of? So they've each got about 16 cases they're managing. Now some kind of go dormant for a bit, others move through pretty quickly. Just to give you a feel for workload, they've got about 16 each of cases they're kind of having to manage to work through, and that can be an issue when we get peaks. It can be less of an issue when we have valleys, but that can affect it. 
But, but part of it is, again, what's the expectation of the staff role? Is staff really to say, this is where it doesn't comply with the code? If you don't meet this provision, here's what it is. Or, and, you know, Maggie alluded to this, it was spending a couple hours with the applicant really kind of drawing it out. Do we want staff kind of getting in there and helping design it? And that affects how hard our process is. And that, again, just kind of goes to staff time. What's our expectation of the role of staff? Here's the stuff you don't comply with, make it comply, versus here's how you could do this, you could shift this, you could shift that. Even again on one last week, you know, they really looked in, and there was more, far more trees than there needed to be on that site. Some of the clients, oh, you require so many trees, wasn't actually the case. And, but it's staff really kind of going through and go, why, why do you have so many trees on this thing? As opposed to going, it me, who am I to tell you what to do? But, but that can be an issue. And that just, again, is part of what our role is. But again, keep that in mind as we get trickier, less complicated. Brian, can I make just a quick comment uh, as you go through this? So we, we had the same problem in Alamo Heights. I mean, we, we would have contractors that would come in and say, you know, the city staff has had our package for three weeks or a month, and we can't get our permit. And they would, they would go to council and tell a council member, and council member would call me, and then I'd look into it, and it turns out, well, yeah, maybe we've had it for two or three weeks, but it was an incomplete package. We sent it back for revision. We never got the revisions. And all the, all the while, we're being told, oh, yeah, everything's been done, and, and it's the staff that's holding up our permit. I mean, it's a very common common thing. It's not just shirts. It, it's ha it happens in, in many places. It's kind of everywhere. But, but, you know, some of those challenges are, again, as Lisa mentioned, there's this criticism staff has multiple bites at the apple. You turn in a set of plans, they give you comments, you turn in revisions that meet it, Here's another set of comments. Fix those. Here's another set of comments. And that happens on occasion. We'll miss stuff. We, we, we miss it or we don't get one side or we don't realize something. But then sometimes they'll make a change on one set and it creates the problem in the other. So it, it works both ways. But I think that's the thing that staff is most aware of. And part of that are having qualified, well-trained, well -trained, tenured staff who are familiar with the code. Because the more familiar you are with the code, the less likely you are to forget that stuff and the more quickly, given that workload, you can kind of click through and hit those comments. Um, you know, we also get this criticism of staff doesn't, you know, there's no flexibility. And as we've talked about, our code doesn't let staff waive that. There are very few areas that they can waive it. Now, staff often would go, I don't know that I necessarily want that authority, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then sometimes it's staff is too slow to respond. And as Mark said, you know, there can be times where, yeah, we've had it three or four weeks, and it's still sitting there. But one of the questions is, is what is that expected turnaround time for what percentage of the time? So how long is the appropriate time on a set of plans? Generally, you know, you get peaks and valleys go quicker or a little slower, but how, how, how quick do we expect this stuff to be turned around? Because keep in mind, it's not just planning and building inspections. You've got a fire review. You've got an engineering review. You may have a health department review. You may have a public works department review. You may have parks looking at it for landscaping or parkland. And so there are multiple departments that have to look at it that if you're waiting on one, you're kind of waiting on all of them that go into it um, moving forward. So with that, what do developers kind of want or what do they not want? What they don't want are surprises. And, and it's with regard, they want certainty of standards. They want to be able to look and say, if I do this, this, and this, I'm guaranteed to get approved. Because when I make this investment, I don't want to find something going, oh, well, actually, there's this other thing. Or I've got this discretionary approval, and, and you can't do it. So they want certainty with the process. Um, and part of that is they want codes that are easy to understand and consistently applied. What they don't want is, why was it here this way, but a different thing this way, right? Seems reasonable. But then we also talked about, well, we want flexibility, and we want staff to try to work with you. Well, that kind of can bite as we interpret or flex or whatever, so a bit of a double-edged sword. They want the ability to estimate cost. They want to be able to go through, much like the other, and say, what are the standards? What's that going to cost me? And does this project, is it fiscally viable? I don't want to get hit with a bunch of extra cost after the fact. So can I calculate my impact fees? Can I calculate my building permit fees? Do I know what that stuff is? And can I evaluate it on the front end? Because as I talked about on the front end, if they've blown that, then they start looking at the end of the project going, I'm over budget, what do I got to cut? And then they start pointing at the stuff in the code that we go, well, we don't have flexibility just because that's the thing they can cut at this time. 
Um, and then they want consistent time frames. We've talked about that. How long is it going to take me to get through the process? How long do I need an option on a piece of property? Assuming they do their part to move through. And so how does that impact the options for the EDC? Developers want flexibility. They'd like staff to be able to say, yeah, your case is unique, and so I'm okay with it. But they also want certainty. What they don't tend to like is, we have this appeal process you can go through, don't know what's gonna happen. Now, we're pretty sure if you go to Board of Adjustment on some sort of sign variance, I can pretty much guarantee you're not gonna get that approved. It's, you know, or an electrified fence. You know, that's going down very quickly. But others, you know, we sit there, you know, I, I met with a developer um, yesterday and was talking about a, a sewer waiver. I said, I don't know what to tell you. I, I really don't know how they're gonna act on it. And they're kind of going, well, that, that doesn't help me. So there's, there's good and bad to that with that, with that certainty. Um, the other part is there needs to be a basis of flexibility. And I'll be blunt, we've heard this from people. You know, it's not one standard for the small local business person, but another for the national chain. You know, we, we hear that. Well, the chains can afford to do that. I, I can't, you know, we can't make those kind of decisions. And also, think about um, those franchisee. It may be a national, but it's a local small business owner who's got that franchise, and so which category do they fall in? And so it's, it's hard to kind of pick and choose. But, but what you've got to avoid, and Dan left, I don't, he fell over, walked out. He would tell you, I think, if he were here, that it can't be arbitrary. If you don't have some basis to tell someone yes and no, you're gonna run afoul of it. You, you can't just randomly kind of pick and choose. You've gotta have some criteria to decide when that's appropriate. And that's why often stuff doesn't make it through Board of Adjustment, because there isn't a hardship. We just don't wanna do this or that. Um, and so then the question is where you've got that, and you've even got those standards, who's best to provide that consistency? Is it city council? You guys know what you want the community to look like. Is it delegated to a board or a commission, or is it delegated down to staff? And I'll talk about that in a minute. You know, but the other is, you know, we can try to create an ordinance to fit every circumstance. The problem with that is you can get so tricky and nuanced it's hard to understand. Even staff will go look at a code from another city and go, I, I got no idea. I've had people, I had people call me in McKinney when I moved to San Antonio going, what were y'all thinking with this? And I'll read it, this was a few years after, and I go, I got no idea. I don't know what we were thinking. I can't tell you how we thought about it. You can get so tricky with stuff, it, it complicates it, going back to, the, to what developers want. Um, you know, the other is, you can build in that flexibility. So again, we've talked about this as an example. You can say, look, here are landscape standards. 12 criteria for where you have land. You gotta meet 90% of those. You can pick which one you do or don't wanna meet. If there's a concern we're lowering our standards, we can tack on a few more, and now you've gotta meet 90%, so you're meeting the same number. But you've got flexibility of which ones you meet. This one poses a problem because of a utility or drainage or something like that. The only challenge with that, and this is a bit of, of those, you know, you, you give them, if Melissa Yulhorn were here, you give a mouse a cookie, we drop that to 90%, Somebody's gonna walk in and go, oh, I can't meet the 90%, what about 85%? You, you always have a bit of that issue, but again, if you have some flexibility, I think it's far better than we are today with these are black and white, you've gotta do them all going forward. Okay, so things to consider. There are some areas where we think we have standards that don't make any sense, and you can reduce those standards, and it doesn't negatively impact the community. So for example, in industrial areas, we've got a requirement, or for all development, we've got a requirement, if you have a vehicular use area adjacent to our property line, you've got to put in a landscape area and screening shrubs. Not a wall, but shrubs, a shrub row. In the industrial development on the other side, if they come in and do their parking row there, they've got to do a shrub row. Now you've got these two shrub rows separating an industrial area. And everybody looks at you and goes, it's an industrial area. How does that add value to an industrial park? You've still got landscape there, but why do you need two rows of shrubs parallel to each? It doesn't add a lot of value. Developers don't understand it. it becomes a maintenance issue. Trucks are backing over all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and so that's one. You know, the other is we've got a standard that says you can't do a freestanding kiosk if the company operating that 
doesn't have space within the shopping center back there. So if you're going, why won't my bank just do a drive through at the shopping center? That would help so much. Well, the reason they may not, we won't let them. Because you guys wouldn't let them because you approve the code. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense today. There was a, probably a reason for it, but as we change with what we do, and if you think about it, you know, tell this story, I don't know when it was, 20, 25 years ago, where you started to see banks popping up on every corner. You know, before that, you had very few, and you have to drive a distance to the bank, you go and you deal with it. And then they started saying, no, I want to be convenient. So they started putting the little branches all over the place. And then what you saw is people start doing stuff online, so they closed the drive through on a lot of them. You know, and, and so it's a change in, in sort of thing. And so nowadays, with how banks work, you know, you sometimes do need cash, having that drive through because you don't need a full location because you don't even have to talk to anybody. So that's probably a standard we want to revisit. There may be reasons for it, but, but probably an easy one that most people would agree on. One of the issues is who do we want to have input? Now, likely you guys are going to go, well, we want the development community to weigh in. We probably want EDC to weigh in. And that's probably true. But if we don't also have our residents weigh in, then that development group has a particular interest that may not be consistent with what our community wants. Because folks talk often about why did they move to shirts? And we saw this a little bit on the citizen survey, and I think it hurts people's feelings. Because you get people who move up in this area and they go, I thought I was moving into shirts, and I moved into civil, or I thought I was moving to civil, and I moved into shirts. They don't quite know the difference, because standards are all pretty high, but they go, it's a good school system, and it's a high quality development. I want controlled development, I want stuff to look nice, unlike name whatever city. And so, again, who do we want to include so that we find that balance? Because if you just listen to one, you, you, you probably don't get what you want. And then again, it's that flexibility. Does it meet a percentage of the requirement? Do we allow exceptions? Do we have standards to particular areas? This zoning district or, or along this corridor, it has this standard. And, you know, how do you do that and still have those codes easily interpreted and aren't too tricky? And so this is where the stuff, while it seems easy on some of the stuff, gets complicated. Okay. And that really is it. So here, here's at the end of the day, I think from a staff perspective, we've got a couple challenges. We can probably fairly easily knock out some of these easy standards, but to ensure we're not doing something that we think fixes the problem, only to find out that didn't really fix the problem, it just moved the problem, and to make sure that we are comfortable with what that change is that we don't look up two or three years from now and you've got a bunch of residents coming in saying, that looks horrible. And ironically, we heard uh, some residents called complaining about the Clean Bee Car Wash on 3009, which is very brightly colored, thank you. And, and that occurred in my tenure as acting city manager and I thanked the resident for chiming in and, and, and said, you would wanna talk to Bob Herrera, that's in Civil Oak. And, and not being critical, but that's where some of that stuff can be nuanced in terms of how you want to allow colors and things like that, so that you don't have some missteps with it. And so I think the point of this is there's some things we can do fairly quickly. There's some things that are frankly going to need some time to make sure we get the right answer. It doesn't need to take forever. But part of it is we have a challenge now in terms of project staff is working on with current staff to be able to do that without us paying a price. Either the software implementation suffers or frankly, the process bogs down. That, that's just a bit of the reality that we, that we face on this one. Um, because I think what likely, as we talked about it, council's gonna say is, let's not take forever, let's not overcomplicate this thing, because you can certainly do that. You know, you can be like City of Austin with Code Next. And I forget how much they spend on Code Next, do you recall? Like a million and a half dollars. They were working on it, big thing, it was gonna be the simplified code, and I went and looked at it one day, and it's like over a thousand pages, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't, this is insane, I can't figure it out. New city manager, Mark can probably empathize, stepped in and said, this thing's nuts, I'm killing it. I'll take the heat for killing a million and a half dollar project, it's, we gotta start over. And, and so, we don't wanna overcomplicate it, it's not rocket science, we can look to other communities, but we wanna make sure we're actually fixing our problem without unintended consequences, and that, that really requires attention of staff, and, and that's what I guess I'm saying our challenge is. 
it's, it's having staff time to put that time in to move it forward in a timely manner so that everybody stands up here and goes, I don't like all of it, but I was heard. I like most of it. I think it's a step forward. That's what we want to have happen, and that just takes staff time to be able to do that, which is where our struggle is now. Yeah, I, I think we need, <clears throat> as a city manager, I would like to understand where council's priorities are on some of these projects. Uh, if, if, you know, part of government is to prioritize, they can't all be number one. And then I think we'd like to bring back a reasonable time frame so that there's understanding, broad understanding among the council and the staff as to what the expectation is. And Alamo Heights, it took us a year to revise the commercial code, much smaller than your code, um, but it took a year. And I think they were satisfied with the product. So um, fast is one thing, uh, but you know we need to consider what the reasonable timeline is. Mr. Edwards. You know, so I can understand the developers wanting you to, to move at the speed of business, but but reality is that we're moving at the speed of government, and and and, and that could be that could be considered to them, you know, dumbfounding, I guess. But at the same token, if we put less regulations in place, that could be extremely beneficial to the business community, but it could also be at the cost of the beautifying of our neighborhoods. Also, it could be detrimental to public safety, you know, because if we just relax all the regulations, that's another issue. So, so I, th I think Dr. Brown is right. Coming up with a timeline, and, and then I think also the staffing issue. You said you're, you're kind of short of body. I think that's where a lot of this lies as well. You can't do, I see the looks on your faces, you can't do it all. And, and maybe, maybe we've just stretched this so far that we need to implement having some more staff. Guys, we're not gonna get smaller, we're not gonna slow down for, for the foreseeable future of our growth. And I think that's gonna be a problem if we don't staff you correctly. So not only do we need to do a, a compensation study, but maybe we need to look at the manpower that we have in your particular department. And I'll leave that up to Dr. Brown, that's his expertise. We're doing that study, just on that note, thanks Councilman Davis, uh, HR will be coming in a few weeks with contracts for the class and comp study and a staffing study. Because I think you're right, we wanna have some data behind that to, to know where we are. I think that's a, that's a valid. And if we don't take care of the people, if we don't take care of the employees that are here now, uh, you, you wanna burn them out? No. You want highly successful and tenured employees that want to come to work. They don't wanna come in and say, oh, another day, man, just drudging through. I don't want that to happen to these people. These are good people and we need to hire other good people to put in there with them to add to the team. Mr. Larson? If I may real quick on, on one point, because I, I think we didn't touch on it, particularly with the site development scenarios, while there's those cleanup things we can do pretty easy that don't really have effect, we'd actually like to adopt the site design standards, all of those, at one point. We'll work on them piecemeal, but the problem is, is if I adopt the landscape section and it goes into effect, and then I adopt the ARC standards, and then I adopt the parking, now I'm, it becomes complicated for folks on which version am I, am I under. And so to some degree, while I can work it up, put it on a shelf, I want them all come in at one time, and so I need to compress. So again, it's not overly complicated. I think we can get there. It doesn't need to take forever. It truly is, we're just really stretched. Hold on. I already recognize Mr. Larson. We'll come right back around. Um, I, I, think, I think getting it right is definitely more important than going fast, although going fast is always nice. And, um, I, and I, I think, you know, we talk about flexibility. I think just from my perspective, I don't, I don't know that flex, I think we should be flexible in our code. I don't know that we should be flexible at the staff level, if that makes sense. And, and, you, sense. and you initiated some of those concerns. Like, you shouldn't have to make a judgment call at the staff level. The, the code should, should pretty clearly outline what you do. And I think it's hard for me, and I'm gonna tease you a little bit, but I, I'd like to know how many residents unsolicited have commented to you about the parking spaces. I mean, the reason I bring that up is I think I've, I've parked a lot of places. I've been on city council not for super long. I read my packet every week. I've gone to tons of meetings. I've done a ton of study. I had no idea there was a difference in parking space sizes. In fact, in all the places all over the New Braunfels, San Antonio shirts that I park in, the only one that's terrible, and I hope they, someone watches this video, is Torchy's Tacos at 
by the quarry. That parking space is a disaster. And I've noticed it because it's, I, I don't know if anyone's been there, but they obviously aren't following the same standards. But other than that, I've never, ever, it's ever rare. once. I'll give you that. It's right. Not often. Now, there, and so, and so there's things like that. And then the other, the other thing I just, and that's just a, the reason I tease you on that is you talk about the developers come with a certain mindset, and that's true. And residents come with a certain mindset, and that's true. And staff comes with a certain mindset, and council comes. And some of our mindset is valuable, and some of it's not. And that's true for every, every player. And so I think it's just a challenge to everybody, including myself, to say, hey, maybe uh, as we do this, we want to get it right. And part of getting it right is you have to get rid of some of those, those preconceived ideas. Because the, the fact is, I'll, I'll go out on a limb, and I'll say if we were to survey the citizens of shirts, 99% would have no idea that we have a different parking size than any other community. And, and, and I think there's a, certainly it's important to, to keep people's minds, hey, what, what kind of community do you want to be in? Um, but some of that, I don't know that it should be, I don't know how strictly that should be identified in our, our UDC. Like you talked about somebody calling to complain about be clean, and well, that's in Cibolo. Well, I've heard a ton of people, that's a, that's a world-class nice facility. Some people think, oh, that's beautiful. I mean, I think uh, Mark Roberts came and said, hey, this is one of the nicest buildings in church. And he showed that strip center that looks like a, off of, it's off Main Street set at Fiesta, Texas. I, I hate it, but he thought it was beautiful. So uh, my point isn't to knock that necessarily, but it's to say th some of those aesthetic things are, are completely, truly the eye of the beholder. And, and I think if I, if I get one thing, and I, I agree with you on that, I think part of it, too, is we can't regulate to ensure somebody designs a nice looking building. As much as we regulate, if they want to design something ugly, they can design it and they can get it through and it can meet the code. And you've heard me talk about it. If I'm so worried about that and I want to try to prevent it, then I'm hanging up a bunch of people I'm not trying to. The other part of it is there are a lot of things that affect how we perceive a building. Frankly, trees are one of them. You know, we talked with PNZ about lot size and residential design, and Jonas Woods is a neighborhood everybody loves. Well, the lot sizes aren't really very big. They're not, they're not huge. And the layouts had some issues, and we have some speeding issues. Well, what makes Jonas Woods? They, they saved all those trees. That, that, and, and so you're right. It's a lot of those factors. Last thing I will touch on, and this is part of it, and you talk about how we look at things. Part of what we try to hire staff for is, is to go into it with a mindset of you're trying to find a win-win. What we don't hire is I've got the power to tell you no. I'm the one who, because if you come in with that mindset, you're about trying to shut somebody down. What we talk about is, it's good for the community. This business is going to provide services our residents are going to want. It's going to provide additional tax base so that we can expand and inflate city programs and grow our budget uh, going forward. But it truly is about finding those win-wins and realizing it's about making a community as opposed to we're fighting. And in other communities, you get that. You get people jaded and worn out. And it's about a battle, not how do we find a solution at the end of the day we're happy with. Yeah, and I think it's just, and I'm, I'm one anecdotal example, but when I've talked to business leaders who have complained about the development process, I have not had complaints related to staff. In fact, I've heard praises related to staff. It's, it's you guys, you guys on this side have, have over the years made it too complicated. And obviously I'm going to be on the extreme one end as other people up here, but I, ultimately, I think I think if we take the time, I love quick wins, but if we take the time to do it right, that's probably more effective. And I think the flexibility comes from simplifying. And I think even the the, the strongest split here from me to whoever is the most regulation heavy, maybe maybe uh, dumpster location, Mr. Edwards, there tease him a little bit. But I think there's going to be a lot of common grounds in terms of there's a way that we can. I think. Looking at and having the conversation ahead, there's significant opportunity for simplification without necessarily sacrificing as much of the hoity-toityness as I'd like to sacrifice from the development code. And and I think that from what I've seen so far, when y'all have come to us, um, I think staff is on that same wavelength because I've every time y'all have come to us, it's been reasonable, very reasonable and well thought out. And so I'm looking forward to the process. I think if, if what's keeping us from doing it right is resources, then we need to we need to fix that on council side. I've got some ideas of where you can get some funds for you out. But you know, um, I think this is certainly certainly a, a, a worthy way to 
invest. Um, and, and one thing, this is just an, this is kind of a, a political jab, but sometimes it feels like we uh, spend a lot of time and move real slow and get a lot of input when we're talking about reducing regulations, but I don't know that it necessarily always goes the other way. But I think um, this is a worthy project. I'd like to get it done right, and I get, I, I was really hoping for quick wins, but I get your comment at the end where you say, hey, if we, if we do this piecemeal, it's, there's going to be overlap that's going to screw us up. So, But thank you for the work you're doing. Let's get, let's get the resources you need, and let's make it happen. Mr. Edwards, you had something else? You know, so, so Brian, a couple of times I came to you and I said, hey, I'm looking at this piece of property or that piece of property or whatever. And you kind of steered me and said, don't, don't do this, don't purchase this. Not, not don't purchase, you said yeah. these are, your, these are your, the faults that you're going to see in here. Um, but not only, not, only, not only that, I went to a couple of um, engineering firms and said, hey, what do you think? But that was long before I put it in a contract. So, uh, so I guess a part of this falls back onto the development community as well because they should do that same due diligence before they come in and say, we're gonna build this particular item or this particular building or, this, or even complete this project. So having, having us change just for the sake of change sometimes is not always the best course of action. And I just, I just think they should do some due diligence. And a lot of this falls right squarely in their, in, in their, in their laps, you know? No, I, I agree with you. I think, I, you know, I, do we still have the requirement for a pre-development conference? So we have a re requirement. Yes, it's it's, 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 so we have, in our UDC, it requires a pre-development conference before you submit. Yeah, okay. So hey, before you submit, you need to come in to meet with us. What percentage do you say do that? All part. Maybe 30% do it. How many people know about it? Well, yeah, and that's the issue. If they're not aware of that. Everyone who calls us. We yeah. offer it to everybody. Yeah. But, but again, it, it doesn't, it's counterproductive to say, well, we're not going to take your stuff because you haven't done this. It, it's just a challenge, and people work at different speeds and different. So it's, it's only, that's a point. The other thing I'll say, and this is where this becomes a bigger effort with the EDC, we move through the site development standards. One thing that I think we need to do is we need to really create then a redevelopment standard because that's a challenge for us. Generally, what our codes do is, it treats you whether you've got an existing building on a site that you're trying to make modifications to or you've got a greenfield, it treats you the same way. And, and really what we need is we need to say it's never going to be the same. And, and I need a different standard for that redevelopment because often we look at that building now and we hear this a lot, it doesn't look very good today. Not quite anything is better than nothing happening, but sometimes it is. And yet if our standards are so onerous it becomes a challenge and so that really is something where this effort stretches out we do the new site development standards we look at what's next and we probably then need to do a redevelopment standard to make it easier to redo sites i'll tell you even the jack-in-the-box site they struggled we had a number of different users come in before that and they just couldn't make it work because when they said we're going to tear the building down we kind of like You've got some vesting stuff, but but it's treated as a greenfield site, and there aren't those exceptions. And so that's where I think this thing we can do and make it a lot easier for a lot of folks and have win-wins. Mr. Gutierrez. Well, Mr. Edwards, uh, Councilman Edwards pointed out a, a interesting point, is that the the business owner is counting on the developer to meet the city's uh, UDC code. And that's where the trifecta is very difficult to accomplish sometimes. Um, I, I, you know, the business owner needs to understand this is an investment. It is an investment on his part. And the de developer's only trying to put the Legos into the, the property that may not fit our standards. Um, I do like the flexibility option on, on the landscaping. I think it's it's a good idea that you know, ninety percent. Okay, so you don't plant one tree. That's not a big deal. So I, I I do love that flexibility option. The other thing I think we also need to consider is new materials. Uh, technology is just 
fast pace and sometimes these things do look like stucco and do look like brick uh, so we we have to we have to find out where that decision is going to be made at uh, whether it's uh, certainly planning and zoning or or what board will make that decision uh, to see whether or not it fits the definition of stucco or masonry in this situation I, I would like to see that as part of the, the new code okay thank you Mr. Brown. Well, thank you guys very much for uh, the update tonight. And you said something earlier that uh, I, I think is spot on. You guys are the ones that know what needs to be fixed more than we do. We, we Granted, we want to keep our standards high and we're going to give you those directions, but uh, you, you're the ones that get the feedback directly and have some pretty good ideas, I'm sure, on how to uh, make this go forward You know, to, to the betterment of all. Uh, and that's all I'm asking for is what are your inputs uh, so that we can make make these changes. You know, there's some low hanging fruit, obviously. You know, but uh, and I agree with what you're saying, Brian. You can't implement in stages. You get, you, you know, we got to get this thing right and then say, okay, the new book is open today. But uh, thanks again for the updates. A lot of stuff out there. And, and if I may, I think one thing. You know, Councilman Davis had, had was was good enough to send some stuff. You know, a lot of this stuff we don't want to reinvent the wheel. What we'll talk about is what's the problem with what we've got, and, and, and staff starts then hunting down codes from other communities, and then starts calling and saying, does that work for you? Because it's funny, you find some community with a code and you think, oh, this is great, and you call them up, and they're like, oh, no, do not adopt our code. It works horrible. Or, or you call up going, hey, I need this clarification. They're like, I just don't want to talk to you. We're just avoiding this thing, and I won't, I won't give you an answer. But other times you find, oh, yeah, this has worked really well. This is the problem we had, and this is the solution. And you can just shirt size it a little bit. Um, you know, funny, working in the Dallas area, everybody copied the Plano standard because it was a real high standard. It worked well for a lot of folks, but depending on where they were as a community, they'd, they'd, they'd maybe lowered a bit or modified a bit. And so it was funny when there was a court case on a provision in their code about churches, they literally had to send the thing out to all the planning departments and the Metroplex going, hey, we just lost this court case on this provision. If you copied ours, you need to amend your code. <laughs> and so, so that's a way to be fairly efficient. You don't have to reinvent the wheel on everything. You, you find those things that work for a community and you, you, you insert it. Anyone else? Just end at the, uh, the same thing that I said earlier, get a timeline for it so that we have, uh, it's not an ongoing forever project and uh, whatever that timeline is, make it realistic for y'all. Do we want to set priorities in a timeline this evening, Dr. Brown, or do you want to let council think about this for a week and then get to that point? I mean, what I heard earlier was we want to set some priorities, we want to make sure that staff knows how to march forward. Yeah, so you want to comment? Yeah, so here, here's a bit of the challenge, and again, I think this is partly why I did it, because staff was concerned about coming up and saying, kind of, woe is us. But, but, you know, what we've got in the planning department, and this would be a planning department effort, is you've got Emily and Nick who are planners. They handle those development applications that come through. They work on some other stuff, be it board of adjustment cases, planning and zoning items. You know, again, you've heard they have about 16 cases they're trying to juggle at, at once. Um, Bryce is heavily engaged in, in the software project and then dealing with some of the more complicated development applications or carryover stuff. And so to be honest, the challenge we've got right now is till we get that implemented, which is probably the end of the calendar year, there, there really isn't staff capacity to take on this sort of effort. And occasionally you get smaller little things that, that come up. That's a bit of the challenge that we're having is to, to sort of do this right um, as you're scrambling around doing all the stuff that comes up on a, on a day to day basis. And again, I, you know, it's a balance. If, if council came back and said, yeah, that's great, but we need to do it, don't have the resources. They'd go back to the office, they'd probably grouse about it tonight, and tomorrow they'd put their noses to the grindstone and they'd get after it. it, it, it things would, would fall, though, apart. Things would take longer, it'd be a challenge. I don't know that we'd get as good a project, but, but they'd make the effort. I, I think they're just really strapped. You know, so th this is really not, <clears throat> this briefing is not a plea for more people. 
yeah. a, by itself. All right. So uh, what this says is if you know if if you all don't want to add more people, and we'll see what the staffing study supports. Um, we just have these issues that uh, that are impacting our ability to move forward and get it done this year. And and so we think City View has to come first. I mean, we've invested five hundred thousand. Uh, our our position as a staff is that City View comes first. We think that pit pads um, it's not going away. It's somewhat volatile still. It's a little bit unpredictable. Uh, so we're we're not sure about that, but. Um, we think that that issue needs to be dealt with. So, in our view, the UDC is really third, in the in the in the, pri in the priority list that we're dealing with. So that's just where we are. Yeah. And uh, if City View takes till the end of the year, uh, I mean, I, I don't think we have to wait till the end of the year to get started on some of the UDC things. But uh, you you may disagree with that. So. I mean, we, we can look at it. The other is, and, and we've talked about this in the past with staff levels, if we look at it in the context of the budget over the summer, I think that's the issue because I don't even think planning staff is going, hey, we've got it worst of anybody. I mean, I think what we've talked about in the past is let's make sure we visit the opportunity cost. And, and so I think from our perspective, if we can kind of get through the budget, get through the staffing study, then it lets us say, okay, this is where this is in context and what's our patience and how do we want to move it forward and things like that. You know, I'll say this for Mark as well. You know, the pit pad taking a fair amount of work, but the pit pad's a little bit like the shed thing. They wouldn't consider it a big effort. It's a, it's a small project, and they can pick up a small project. The UDC is a, is a big project kind of thing, much like the annexation stuff is and much like the comp plan is. And the small ones will keep popping up. We don't know what it is, but we know in two months some other thing will pop up and we'll, we'll want to deal with it. Well, given the given the current Manning levels, what what is a reasonable time to get the UDC back in front of council? Yeah, I mean, I, I think well, so I, I think likely what staff would say is we we probably do need to get the city view done, and that's probably the end of the year, and then we start the effort in in 2020, and and it's probably your your three, three and a half months till we come to you and say, hey, we want to float this section to you. We're not going to adopt it yet, but we've looked at the landscape and let's talk about that. Let's see if we can get all on the same page and then we'll keep working on the other. But yeah, we likely would not really start this with, with maybe doing a little bit of legwork of pulling codes and getting codes from other cities and starting to kind of map them out till we get city view done. And that's probably, probably first of the year. So we're looking at the, about this time next year. It, it looks at this time next year, yeah. I mean, I mean yeah, likely we'd be, you know, I, I think we can do the thing in six, seven months. I mean, I think we can do a good job on the site design standards and have it approved within about seven months, not overblowing the input round and round, but having enough that we've heard what people said, not making it overly tricky, really looking at what other places do. I think we can do it, um, you know, and I, I think, you know, frankly, staff does a good job of being able to write and, and they can kind of crank that writing out pretty quickly. You know. Now, if there was something in the staffing study or some uh, mid-year budget adjustment that was done, that might change the. Yeah, and that may be it. If we if we go through the budget process, and 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 you know, this is really I think where staff sees it. If if we say at this point with our community, we really need to have this focus all the time on long-range planning, which which we don't. The current planners do long-range planning here. As you get bigger you tend to have that focus. How do we update those plans? How do we implement those plans? How do we not miss stuff? How do we integrate those plans? You know, how do we work on redevelopment tends to go under long range planning as well. How do we take those older neighborhoods and, and modify codes for them? You know, likely what we would say is it's a bit of adding to do both. It's to tackle, to free up some capacity to do the EDC, but then it's also to emphasize the long range planning stuff so that we're not kind of getting caught behind on some things or, or struggling to do this stuff. Again, the bulk of their time is just taking up responding to development applications. I mean, it just, it, it's just the priority and everything else you do as you can. Other comments or thoughts? Sounds like City View, pit pads, and then we'll come back around okay. to the UDC. No one is shaking their head, they're all nodding. So let's, let's move forward as such. Thank you all. I appreciate the update.
All right, next up, we've already um, disposed of our consent agenda items. We have, it looks like, a single discussion item, uh, and that item is Resolution 19R59, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a program and expenditures for certain infrastructure improvements along Main Street by the City of Shirts Economic Development Corporation, or the SEDC, and other matters in connection therewith. Kyle, good evening, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, coming forward tonight at the last EDC board meeting in April, uh, EDC, after several uh, times of visiting the issue, including a joint session with council, um, considered a, a new project for infrastructure improvements to the Main Street uh, project that the city is currently doing. So a little bit of background. Uh, the city, through a, a bond in 2010, approved funding for the Main Street area. Um, these funds would be added to that project uh, specifically for authorized infrastructure improvements that we'll walk through. So in, uh, in starting, uh, at the Economic Development Board meeting, uh, the board approved a resolution, an economic development resolution for the same um, request that is being made right now by the council. Um, what that would do is it would allow the EDC funds to be used for infrastructure improvements within uh, the highlighted area. Uh, the infrastructure improvements would be limited to uh, streets, roads, rail spurs, water, utility lines, electric utilities, gas utilities, drainage, site improvements, and related improvements. Uh, each of those are qualifying uh, expenses under the local government code that the economic development is required to follow. Uh, following is the graphic that was included in the resolution. And so just in summary, uh, what the resolution that was presented to you would do would authorize the program, which is the uh, infrastructure improvements uh, that the Economic Development Board has found are necessary or required for the promotion of new or expanded businesses within the Main Street area, and then it would authorize up to $500,000 uh, that would be used. Um, that money would be allocated as part of the upcoming budget. So right now, no, movie, no money is, is being moved. Um, and with that, are there any questions? Council. Mr. Edwards. I, I'd like to just make one comment. I saw the parking lot is being redone down there, and it looks really good. Um, and, and I got to tell you, this is long, long overdue. Uh, we've had this vision for how long, Mr. Mayor? Quite some time. I mean, at least since the bond that was passed in 2010. Yeah, and we talked about it prior to that. Um, when Mayor Baldwin was here, we were talking about Main Street. I can tell you, I think this is a good project for us to, to I would like to see more money, actually, but that's always me thinking about money. Um, I just think that's a good opportunity for us to go forward with this tonight. Dr. Scagliola. Yeah, thanks so very much for bringing this to us. Uh, one, of, one of the things I'd like to see, though, is, is um, some targeted uh, projects. Not, not just saying, okay, we, we have uh, like half a million dollars um, that we might be able to use for something. No, let's, let, let's find something targeted. And then let's, not a one-time good deal. You know, if it can be used as, as as an incentive, or, or I don't know what the incentive is, but to keep going year after year after year. It, it's all about incremental improvement. I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed at, at the uh, amount of enthusiasm for uh, the, the walking on, on, on Maine, um, things we've been doing lately. It, people come out in, in force. I, God's honest truth, I never thought I'd, I'd see it. Um, but every time we have one of those events, it gets a little bit better and better, and that's incremental improvement. Um, I'm just wondering where we can take it, but I know that a million dollars isn't a lot of money, uh, and half a million is even less than that. It's going to take some greenbacks to get it done. Yeah. So, um, so thank you uh, for, for taking this first step. And, and I think that the, the board, as they considered this project, they, you know, they saw that as well. 
they see this as, you know, the first step. You know, so ultimately, uh, by the board's action and by the authorization of funds, what we're able to do is to, you know, to go to the engineer and identify those very specific projects. Um, the, you know, the language also is, is targeted that um, we are to identify those that bring the most, you know, immediate, most visible improvements so that we can get something happening. And over time, you know, we, we were open in saying, you know, we may come back for more money, you know, as we have success and as it grows and, you know, encourages businesses to invest on Main Street. I'm going to move from the chair that we approve resolution 19R59. Second. A motion from the chair, second from Mr. Edwards. Any other comments, questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. Motion carries. Next up, we have a roll call vote confirmation. The first is consent items one through three. Councilmember Edwards made the motion. Councilmember Gutierrez made the second. Mayor Pro Tem Hayward voted yes. Councilmembers Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Scagliola, and Brown uh, voted yes. Motion passed. Second is item number four, resolution 19R62. Councilmember Scagliola made the motion. Councilmember Edwards made the second. Mayor Pro Tem Hayward voted yes. Councilmembers Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Scagliola, and Brown voted yes motion passed item 5 resolution 19 r 59 uh, motion was made from the chair council member edwards made the second mayor pro tem hayward voted yes council members davis gutierrez larson edwards scagliola and brown mo um, voted yes motion passed thank you ma'am next up requests and announcements and first uh, any other announcements dr brown Stephen, very good. Request by the mayor and council members that items be placed on a future city council agenda. Anything that we don't currently have scheduled that we have a need for. I don't see any takers. Announcements by the mayor and council members. We'll start with Mayor Pro Tem Hayward. Mayor, I had a busy week, I guess, or a couple of weeks. I uh, the first thing I did was I went to the uh, church chamber mixer on Friday for the um, Fiesta Metal reveal. And uh, between Brenda and Maggie, and Brenda won with 148 medals. Uh, so go Brenda! It was it was a great event. Um, then I attended the uh, went to the Tri County uh, Chamber Golf Tournament. I volunteered there at the Putting Green. It was a good event. I know I don't putt, but a lot of them were telling me how the Putting Green was working. So I learned a little bit of golf that day. I had the opportunity to go to the Guadalupe County Mayor's meeting. Uh, it was more of a round table and um, I really did uh, learn a lot and appreciate being there. It was a good learning event. Uh, I went to the National Day of Prayer at the Y. It was an awesome event and Mayor gave an awesome uh, presentation for the government and the history that was behind it. I really appreciated that and everyone else that gave prayers was uh, good, it was a really nice turnout. Um, and a shout out to Chick-fil-A for uh, the breakfast. Uh, let's see, I did the Sweetheart Coronation. Um, that was a lovely event, I'm glad I wasn't a judge. Um, all the girls were very talented. Uh, so that was a great event. I did the Clemens Decision Day, um, watching all the young kids make the decisions for their future, which was a great day. I attended the Lions uh, Casino Night. That was cool. And then I did the student council meeting today. And the group of kids that we had were a very awesome bunch. Had a lot of good questions and did a very good a presentation on their vote as being council and mayor. So thank you. That is all. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Davis? Uh, yes, sir. I had the uh, pleasure of attending the Sweetheart Coronation uh, pageant. It was uh, an incredible evening. Uh, best wishes to all the girls that are going to represent uh, shirts as ambassadors in the upcoming year. And uh, great effort by, uh, by everybody involved. Also attended the uh, Lions Club uh, Casino Night, great community night, uh, raising funds for our community and their programs. And I also attended the uh, funeral services for Linda Babineau from 311 and extended our condolences to her family. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. 
Yes, uh, a couple of things. Uh, coffee at the Chamber, congratulations, Brenda, for winning the medal competition. I also had the distinct pleasure to participate in the uh, J, oh, uh, the Joint Base San Antonio Randolph uh, Half Marathon. It was a great event. Uh, exhausting, too. Uh, the Tri-County Golf Tournament, I also uh, helped uh, with the putting on that one. National Day of Prayer at the YMCA, thanks to the YMCA for hosting the event. The Sweetheart Banquet, thanks to all the young ladies that participated. Uh, decision Day at Samuel Clemens, congratulations to all the graduates. I think you have 16 days left. And also attended the uh, Lions Club uh, Casino Night. It was a great event. That's it. Very good, Mr. Larson. Nothing. Mr. Edwards. I'm simply all over the city, thank you. Dr. Scagliola. Golly. Yeah, the Sweethearts um, pageant, I, I kind of look forward to that every year. It was a really super event. Thanks so much to the staff for, for putting that on. Um, Lions Club Casino Night on Friday. Say, say thanks to uh, Council Member or, or Commissioner Wolverton, our mayor and uh, council members who, who attended. Thanks for uh, adding a bit of credibility to our little club. On uh, Saturday, the Wine and Sanger Fest out, out in New Braunfels. I mention that mostly because uh, our our band trailer was out there on, on in full display. So that's all I have, sir. Very good, Mr. Brown. I like Mr. Edwards all over the place. I, and I don't think that there were uh, I don't think there were any events uh, that I attended that weren't mentioned by the council. Uh, however, I'd like to remind the council that uh, Thursday evening, I believe most of us were invited to serve uh, the VIP section at the uh, at, at Purse Bingo. Um, I, I will be there, but I will be competing for a bag. So, um, <clears throat> with that said, if there's nothing else from staff or from council, we stand adjourned. <laughs>